Hey students, it is Miss Maples. Um, I am here to teach you how to use TIPFAST, which is an acronym to help you analyze a poem. Um, so we are going to be using Robert Frost's poem, Nothing Gold Can Stay, because it is a really strong poem. It has um, all of the main literary devices that you need to understand um, within it. And uh, it's nice and short. It's only eight lines long. So let's go ahead and get started. And I apologize if you can hear Oliver in the background. It's bath time and it's pretty noisy in the next room over, so I apologize. So here's your table for today. Um, so TIPFAST is an acronym that takes you through the steps of analyzing a poem. Uh, I'm not gonna teach you the whole acronym today. I'm just gonna teach you the first three letters. So um, the first things you do when you analyze a poem are look at the title, do a quick paraphrase of the poem, and look at the figurative language. Now the figurative language encompasses many pieces, so don't get overwhelmed. I'll walk you through each one, um, but figurative langu and language is what's gonna take us the longest today. Uh, this looks like a lot, but it's mostly notes, so you only have to listen carefully to my video and fill in the boxes in white, okay? And you will be golden, pun intended, because I am punny. Um, so follow along and pause if you need to and fill in the boxes. Make sure you're listening carefully because everything I'm going over and I'm teaching you in regards to Nothing Gold Can Stay, we're going to use with other poems this week. Okay, we're going to be looking at um, the really awesome inaugural poem, the one that was read, performed at the inauguration, um, and then some other Harlem Renaissance poetry. All right, so... How to is in this column. So everything on this left column right here, let me use my pointer. So everything in this column over here is um, for notes, okay? And then everything over here is where you answer. You see the white boxes along the way. So first step. The first thing you need to do when you go to analyze a poem is to look at the title. Titles are very carefully chosen by the poet. Um, and you need to mark the connotation of each word in the poem, or in the title, I mean. So um, connotation means the feeling that we attach with the word, okay? Like love is positive plus hate is negative, and then um, something like desk is neutral. We don't really have like a feeling attached to that word. So that's what we're gonna be doing with the title, Nothing Gold Can Stay. And then after you have marked the connotations, based on just the title, make a prediction. What might this poem be about? Okay, so nothing gold can stay. We're not even going to read it yet. We're just looking at that title. Nothing. When I hear the word nothing, that's usually bad, negative. And gold I think of as positive. So if it's nothing gold can stay, then nothing is a bad thing, right? Because I want gold things to stay. Gold is often symbolic of wealth or beauty, right? So I'm going to mark nothing as negative. I'm going to mark gold because we think of gold symbolically as wealth and beauty as positive. Can, just kind of a neutral word, right? Doesn't have a lot of um, feeling attached to it. And then stay, probably neutral as well. Okay, so based on the title, make a prediction. What can the po or what might the poem Nothing Gold Can Stay be about? So you're going to make your own prediction, but I'm going to help you right now. So when I read Nothing Gold Can Stay, um, maybe it's about how money or maybe beauty 
depending on how help, like gold is used. Doesn't stay. You're just making a prediction. It doesn't matter if it ends up being right. Just take a stab at it. Okay. So you've analyzed the title. Now we're moving on to paraphrasing the poem. Okay, which is tricky, but I'm just having you guys do it in kind of a simplistic way. So to paraphrase the poem, read it over, think about it for a second, and reword like the main ideas that you're getting from it. It doesn't have to be perfect. I just want to see you interacting with it, making a first try at understanding and analyzing the poem. Okay, so let's go ahead and read it so we can do that. Nothing gold can stay. Nature's first green is gold, her hardest hue to hold, her early leaves a flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden sank to grief, so dawn goes down to day, nothing gold can stay. Well, it's kind of... If I had to sum up what this poem is going over, it's kind of how nature changes, right? It goes from green to gold. Flowers don't stay forever. Um, dawn doesn't stay forever. So I'm going to go back here and write this poem is basically about how nature changes nothing stays for long just my first attempt at kind of summing up what the poem's about don't overthink this just do your best that you can all right moving on figurative language we've done the t the p and now we're on to f F is definitely the biggest piece of analyzing a poem. F stands for figurative language. Figurative language is all of the stuff that a poet does that isn't meant to be taken literally, kind of hits at our heart instead of our head, okay? Um, and there's a lot that goes into that. We're going to look at word choice. We're going to look at things like imagery, metaphors and similes, personification, symbols, allusions. And we're also going to look at how they create sound, rhythm throughout their poem using things like alliteration, assonance, and consonants. Um, I could teach an entire class on figurative language. It's that big of a concept, but we're not going to try to get into all that right now. Um, we're going to take it piece by piece. I'm really trying to not overwhelm you with all of this, so I hope it's working. All right, so figurative language, we're first going to look at diction, okay? The word diction means word choice, okay? Poets choose words with great care to create the tone that they want. It's important to look over their choices, okay? So when we analyze diction, what I would like you to do is to choose five words in the poem that seem particularly important, and for those five words, mark their connotation. So does it have a positive feel, plus? a negative feel to it, minus, or no feeling at all, negative, or neutral, N. So let's go back to the poem. So I'm kind of looking it over. Um, I'm going to, hardest maybe is important. Again, don't overthink it, just what stands out to you. Flower seems pretty important to me. subsides stands out to me eden dawn and nothing so I think I picked more than five. Okay, so we'll leave Eden out because we're going to talk about Eden later with something different. So these are the five words that I am going to look at their connotation, okay? Connotation is the feeling of the word. So we've got 
hardest flower subsides dawn you can pick different words or you can pick the same as me if this helps you just to kind of work through it with me and nothing okay so now i'm going to think about how the word is used in the poem and the feeling it gives off so it said nature's first green is gold her hardest hue to hold usually holding if something's hard to hold on to that's like a negative thing we usually think of something being hardest as negative so i'm going to put that as negative flower well, flowers, we kind of associate with something positive or beautiful. So I'm going to mark that as a plus. Subsides means go away. Well, if it's something bad subsiding, then that's a good thing. But if something good is subsiding, that's bad. So let's go look at it in the context. Then leaf subsides to leaf. So first we have a flower on a tree. And then we just have a bunch of leaves. That's kind of boring, right? Like the beautiful thing, like the leaf the, the bud and the beautiful flower that doesn't stay for very long. And then we just have leaves on the tree and then the leaves die. So I'm going to go with subsiding being a bad thing. Because in nature, the beautiful stuff doesn't stick around very long. Dawn, we usually associate dawn with beauty. That morning light. Again, it doesn't last very long, but it's really beautiful while it does. And nothing... Nothing gold can stay. Going back to that, it's kind of negative. So we've got negative and positive in this, in this poem, right? We just kind of looked at that. Now, the next thing that you need to think about is, is the diction more formal? Is Robert Frost using words that you could use in an English essay or in a resume? Or is it more like slang? Like later we're going to be reading a poem called... Um, mother to son where it has things like i've been a climbing on son i've been turning corners like talking more like how you would actually speak um so this poem if we go and look back at it it's pretty formal there's no slang it's not fancy but it's formal it's very approachable and understandable but there's no slang so i'm going to say formal and i'm just going to add in but not fancy we can all read it and pretty much understand it, right? It's not like we have to get out a dictionary to understand this poem. Okay, so next let's analyze imagery. So imagery is language that evokes a mental image or that you can almost feel, touch, taste, smell, hear. Imagery is language that makes it seem like it's real, it's with you. So I wrote an example. Rain trickled down the window, streaking the dirt in a gray, muddy pattern. That was one that I just wrote because it's rainy outside. So let's go see if we can find any language that really like has a strong image with it. Um, this poem is pretty brief, so I wouldn't say there's super strong imagery. Maybe So Dawn Goes Down Today has pretty good imagery. Like I can imagine that happening. It's not the best imagery I've, all, I've ever read, but I'm going to, I think it's decent. Okay. You're going to see with poetry analysis, poetry is like emotional and it's individual. So we're not going to all come up with the same answers. That's okay. I just want you to understand why you picked the answer you picked. So Dawn goes down to day. I think that was line seven. I always want you guys to write the line number. Yep. Okay, and then what's the effect of this imagery? Um, I'm going to write, I can really see the beautiful dawn light fading into the normal daylight. Dawn is special, right? We don't see dawn very often, just like sunsets are special. Um, the rest of the day, 
no one's like, oh, the sun, like it's not that big of a deal. So it kind of make puts an image of my head of how those moments don't last that long. Okay, so next we're going to analyze a poem's use of metaphor and or simile. Okay, so metaphors are direct comparisons between two unlike things. A comp, an example that you probably you've heard of from the song is life is a highway, right? Life isn't literally a highway, but we can understand that it's kind of like one because there's twists and turns and you go slower and faster and someone cuts you off, right? Um, so that is a metaphor. Life is a highway. A simile is an indirect comparison between two unlike things, but you use like, as, or than. So it's the same thing as a metaphor, but it's indirect. So an example would be, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. The line from Forrest Gump, that movie, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Um, so we're going to go back and see if we can find an example of a metaphor or a simile. And I'm pretty sure this poem has both, if I remember correctly. So nature's first green is gold, her heart is hue to hold. Her early leaf's a flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden sank to grief. So dawn goes down to day, nothing gold can stay. Is there a time where two things are being compared, and it's not literal, but we should just kind of understand it. Um, green is gold is an example and um, leaves a flower. So both of those would work because a leaf isn't a flower literally. So her early leaves a flower, nature's first green is gold. I'm going to pick this one. And that's the first line, right? Nature is first, green is gold. Green isn't gold, so it, we have to figure it out in a non-literal way. So nature is first, green is gold. Usually the newest parts of nature are the most beautiful. Think about spring, right? The flowers first, the buds showing up, and everything being so new, right? So I'm going to say how... Um, Nature is most beautiful at the very beginning. Everything is fresh and new. The green is golden in a metaphorical way. So I kind of explained um, how this metaphor enhances the poem, what its purpose is, what it means. So that's what you, I want you guys to explain. Whatever you find, try to explain it. Explain what it means, how it enhances the poem, why it matters. Okay. All right. Um, analyzing personification. So personification is when an inanimate object is given human or animal characteristics. So this is used a lot, like the wind howled and growled, or the leaves danced in the breeze. Wind doesn't howl and growl. That's what an animal does. Leaves don't dance, right? But we often give inanimate objects um, living characteristics. So let's go see if Frost did that anywhere here. Um, well, he says her, but he's not talking about a woman. He's talking about nature. So that's personification, right? Nature is not a woman, but he's using it that way. So... Let's go back to our table. So copy and paste an example. Could just copy those two lines, right? That 
That's lines one and two. Okay, so now let's explain it. Nature's first green is gold, her heart is hue to hold. We've all heard of nature being described as a woman, mother nature. It's like a common personification. So nature is often personified as a mother. as a caring individual. So we all are familiar with this comparison, right? Um, and I'm going to say it makes nature seem very personal if it's given that personification. As you can see, there's not like nice, neat, right, wrong answers. I'm going to be happy seeing the thought that you all put into this. So don't, don't overdo it. Like don't, don't worry about if it's right or wrong. As long as you can tell me why you think something's personification and why you think it's important, then you're good and I'm happy. Okay. So let's move on to symbols. Okay, so a symbol is an ordinary object, but we give it extraordinary significance or a color that we give significance to. Like a wedding ring is a symbol of love and commitment. An olive branch, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but from an olive tree, that's a symbol of peace. The color green is often used symbolically, like as nature or um, sometimes you can say someone's green with envy, right? So we often use colors and objects as symbols. So let's go and see if there's anything symbolic in this poem. There's actually a lot of symbolism. Gold is symbolic. I would say flowers are symbolic. Um, dawn. And the color gold is symbolic. Okay, you don't have to analyze all of these. Um, let's do gold and flower. That was line one, I think flower is from line three. Okay, so what's the effect of the symbol? How does, or what does the symbol stand for? How does it enhance the poem? So gold is symbolic of beauty, goodness, wealth, gold can't stay. So, not super great. That's what keeps being emphasized in the poem is that nothing gold can stay, that the gold goes away. That's not happy, right? We want the gold to stick around. Um, and then flower, her early leaves a flower, but only so an hour. So flowers are beautiful, but they don't last. sad face. So uh, you're probably starting to see, okay, I'm starting to get kind of what this poem is about. If it keeps describing all these beautiful things that go away, it's starting to put the whole meaning of the poem together for you. That's why we go through and analyze it like this. It really breaks it down for you. Okay. Next is illusion. And illusion, not illusion, like a, ooh, I thought I saw something that I didn't. An allusion is a reference to art, literature, or history that a poet does. It's like a shout out to what someone else has written or something else that's happened. So like Of Mice and Men, that book you read freshman year, Of Mice and Men comes from the poem To a Mouse. 
Steinbeck took a line out of a poem and put it as his title. He was alluding to someone else's poem. Okay. Poets love to allude to Greek mythology or the Bible. Whenever they do a shout out to Greek mythology or the Bible, that's an allusion. Okay. So let's go see if we can find an allusion. If you aren't familiar with the Bible, you might have read Eden and been like, what the heck is he talking about? Eden, what, right? Eden is a biblical illusion. You have to know about the Bible to get that illusion. And that was on line six. So this is an allusion to the Garden of Eden where it was beautiful and perfect. For Adam and Eve, not even Eve, but Eve ate from the tree of knowledge and God kicked them out of the garden. Very simple summary of that biblical story. Okay, so Eden sank to grief. Eden was beautiful and perfect, but humanity didn't get to live in Eden. They ruined that real quick, right? Um, so... I'm going to add that the beautiful and perfect things don't last. You're probably saying that that's basically this whole poem over and over again. The beautiful, perfect stuff doesn't last. Nothing gold can stay. Okay, alliteration, assonance, and consonance. These words sound scary, but they're actually... Not that bad. Um, these are sound devices that create a cool sound or rhythm in poetry and in songs. If any of you are fans of rap, go pull up a rap song that you like, and you will see that alliteration, assonance, and consonants are used tons in music. Okay, Alliteration is when the first sound of words repeats, like Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers, that p repetition is alliteration. Consonance is when um, consonant sounds inside of words repeat. So I was trying to find an example, and I love the play Hamilton. And there's a line from the title song that says, the, ten, the $10 founding father without a father got a lot farther. There's a repetition of a th th sound in it, that TH sound, and it creates this rhythm. The $10 founding father without a father got a lot farther. Okay. Assonance is when you repeat um, a vowel sound, a, 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 one of the vowel sounds inside of words. So Edgar Allan Poe has a poem that says me mellow wedding bells. That a, a, a repetition is assonance. This is going to take some practice, you guys. So if that kind of stressed you out, we'll keep coming back to it. Um, You'll get it. It's not that bad. It just takes practice being able to recognize it. So let's go see if we can find alliteration, assonance, or consonants, and then analyze how it creates effect. Nature's first grain is gold, her hardest hue to hold. Ooh, that's good um, alliteration right there. Her hardest hue to hold that repetition of the huh sound so that's an example of alliteration her hardest hue to hold just like peter piper picked right um let's see what about her early 
leaves a flower. That er sound repeats. Because it's a consonant sound. That would be an example of consonants. Her early leaves a flower. Um, there's others. He's Robert Frost knows how to create sound in his poem. He's really good at it. Um, only so. An hour, that O sound repeating, that would be assonance. Only so an hour, okay? Again, if that was a little tricky for you, it's all right. We'll get back to it. Let's let's stick with the alliteration because that one's a little bit more simple. So an alliter alliteration would be her hardest hue to hold. And I'm going to go ahead and... Um, do bold to show it that repetition at the beginning of each word is alliteration. Okay, so what is the effect of this? I would say it's nothing super fancy. It his poem has good rhythm. Like I memorized this poem shortly after the first time I read it because it's just got such good rhythm and such good sound to it. Nature's first green is gold. Her hardest hue to hold. Her early leaves a flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf. So Eden sank to grief. So dawn goes down to day nothing gold can stay. It's just part of his creating rhythm, right? I'm going to say that it creates great rhythm and makes the poem memorable. These are things you like about songs without even, you probably haven't realized that that's what you like about it. Okay. I just took you through the first part of tip fast. Tomorrow you're going to take on attitude tone, structure, and theme, which I think will actually be faster because figurative language is like the most stuff you have to know. So we will do that tomorrow. And as long as you filled out all of these boxes, you are good. You could have written just what I wrote, or you could have written your own way. Either way is fine. Hopefully you have a little bit of a better understanding of these terms and we will continue on with this tomorrow. All right. Bye.